Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Luis Garcia from University College London, and uh, he will talk about Einstein cool cycles and value of error functions. Please, Luis. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, uh, should we start the recording or? It started already. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. Uh, so, yeah, let me start by thanking um, the organizers for having me. Uh, I am really grateful to be in this conference, especially uh, to have the opportunity to thank Steve. Steve has been a great inspiration to me. I um, Early on during grad school, I printed his famous paper in the Annals on Central Derivatives, and I used to carry it around, uh, trying to digest it slowly. Um, and th that took a while. Uh, but fortunately, I met Steve at a conference early as well at um, the Bel Air Research Institute in Barbados. And um, I think our first conversation was about snorkeling. And uh, that somehow, uh, uh, yeah, it was clear that he was very approachable. And um, well, um, since then I, I tried to talk to, ha to him as much as I could. And he has been a great mentor as well. I was a postdoc of him uh, um, until two years ago. So um, yeah, so it's, it's great to be able to thank him. So I hope you like the talk, Steve. Right, so I want to talk about uh, joint work with Nicolas Bergeron and Pierre Charlois. Um, the preprint just appeared on the archive. Um, and this is part of a um, project in progress that also involves actually Venkatesh. So um, what I want to do is um, talk about some constructions of um, group cost cycles for arithmetic groups. Um, there are a number of such constructions in the literature. Typically, um, they are valued in spaces of uh, functions or differential forms with singularities. And um, there are several um, such constructions. And what we would like to do is give um, a point of view on these constructions using equivariant cohomology. Um, and this way, we will obtain some, some generalizations. And I also want to discuss an application to special values of HKL functions. So um, for certain HKL functions, there, is, there was a conjecture of Colmez on um, an explicit formula for the critical values. And um, I'll, I'll explain how, how, the proof of this, how we can prove this conjecture. So, OK, I want to start by considering an explicit example um, which was first um, observed by Sedge. So you let epsilon of x be the cotangent function, um, which you can um, just write as the sum of 1 over x plus m, uh, appropriately regularized. Then you have this addition relation, um, which, is, which is very easy to show. Um, and um, Sedge's observation is that you can um, that this can be interpreted as a um, relation in, um, in terms of modular symbols for SL2. So let me talk very briefly about modular symbols. Um, so H here is the Poincaré upper half plane. H star is the compactification by um, adding the cusps. And um, um, given two cusps, I denote by R comma S, the oriented geodesic um, in H star from R to S. And then one can consider the vector space generated by these symbols, um, R comma S, uh, where one imposes these two relations. Um, so there is a relation coming from um, um, orientation, um, and you ha also have a triangle relation. So basically, the symbols correspond to geodesics in the upper half plane from R to S. And um, yeah, um, the relations um, have to do with uh, with triangles uh, in the upper half plane and with reversing the orientation. So the elements of this space are called modular symbols. Oh. Um, and um, it's an observation of Manin that one can just, there is a subset of symbols that generates this space, is this um, set of unimodular symbols. 
they correspond to um, rational uh, to cusps a over c and b over d that satisfy this relation um, a d minus b c is plus minus one so now let me consider um, the space of functions on c star squared and uh, i don't know that by m of c star squared and uh, i'm going to quotient by the constant function um, and the reason has to do with uh, the identity I showed you in a previous slide um, where the right-hand side was one and I would like that to be zero. So, um, so let's just, I'll just quotient by the constant function. And then such as observation is that there is a map that takes a um, unimodular symbol to this particular product of two cotangent functions, epsilon of dx minus by times epsilon of minus cx plus ay. And um, this actually induces a well-defined map from the space of modular symbols. Um, so it's defined by this uh, explicit formula only for unimodular ones, but you can prove that it extends to an s to z equivalent map. And um, so, yeah, that's... Um, a picture of um, how one can think of this map. And uh, right, so now given this homomorphism, um, you can um, look at um, the Hecke algebra acting on this um, home space. And in fact, this um, homomorphism is Eisenstein. In other words, it's killed by this particular um, operator. TP is the usual Hecke operator um, here. And um, well, given this one, can imagine, okay, can one um, generalize this in different ways? For example, um, if one takes an, a product of n um, uh, times the tangent function, can is that possibly related to the homology of SLN and Z? And then what about other functions? There are other constructions that have the same flavor um, involving things like modular units and so on. And I will come back to this a bit later. Um, so one way to rephrase such an observation is that you can just look at the um, values of this map on modular symbols of the form infinity and a translate by an element of S of two Z. And then um, we are just saying that um, this map defines a co-cycle for S of two Z valued in this space. And the idea is to try to generalize this for, um, for other groups. Okay, so um, I'm going to explain a bit of an abstract framework um, that gives rise to these group co-cycles, and then I will explain how one can compute it in explicit examples. So I start with a discrete group G, and I take a G space X, uh, that is also an abelian group. And uh, for D, I take a finite linear combination of torsion points that's stable under G. And finally, x star is going to be x minus um, the points in the support of the removed. So, so here are the examples I want to consider. So the first um, case is the affine case. Um, so x here is affine n space. D is just the origin. And g is the group g l and c made discrete. Uh, we also have the multiplicative case, um, c n mod z n. And uh, there we just take D to be some uh, divisor supported on the M torsion and G to be um, some group stabilizing um, D, for example, the principal congruence group of level M inside SLNZ. What are the GNC data? What is G? Oh, uh, it means a GNC regardless of discrete group. What? So, so it's GL and C made discrete, discrete topology. Oh, discrete topology. So it's GL and C, uh, so you mean discrete topology, yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, G is a discrete group here. Uh, yeah. So, um, right, so there's also the elliptic case where one takes X to be E to the N, uh, where E is an elliptic curve, and then again, one looks at the M torsion and, and at an appropriate subgroup. And in fact, well, one can think of a fourth case, which is the case where E has complex multiplication by, um, by some um, uh, order in an imaginary quadratic field. 
And uh, this is this last case is the case that I will focus on um, uh, later in the talk. But what I want to point out is that in all cases, um, uh, our observation is that there is a canonical class in the equivariant cohomology of X star. Um, and here, by, by this I mean equivalent cohomology um, that's essentially with integral coefficients. Um, so the class is not exactly integral, but um, it's only divisible by a few small primes. So let me um, explain a bit about um, equivariant cohomology and how such a class um, one would expect that gives rise to a co-cycle. So, um, right, so um, equivariant cohomology groups, we're, we're taking the Borel construction, so we have our discrete group G and then we form the space EG, which is some space that um, is contractible and has, and where G acts freely. And the idea for equivariant cohomology is that you, um, you want to consider the cohomology of a quotient of X by G, but if you just take the quotient um, of X by G uh, naively, then you lose too much information if the action of G is not free. So first you replace X by something which is homotopy equivalent, namely X times EG. And uh, now on X times EG, the action of G is free. So you take the uh, uh, quotient um, uh, of that by G. And uh, the cohomology of this space is by definition the equivalent cohomology of, of X. So, um, right, so we also had a linear combination of points that was stable by G. And this linear combination has a fundamental class that I call brackets D. Um, and it's just um, the fundamental class in usual cohomology applied to the Borel construction. Um, so we have a long exact um, cohomology sequence here. And the point is that um, for the classes that we will consider, our map D, our class D maps to zero here. So it comes from this group. And um, our observation is that there is a preferred lift. I mean, of course, in principle, uh, this only tells us um, that D comes from this group up to the image of this group here, but um, there is a preferred way of, of lifting. So assuming that, let me explain why, um, how, how such a class should give rise to a group co-cycle with values in some, some space of singular functions in some sense. Um, so if you are applying the Borel construction to an, an affine variety, to a G variety, and it happens to be affine, um, then, well, then you know that you have cohomological vanishing above the dimension and uh, then you can look at this um, map from the Borel construction to BG, the classifying space for G. And this is a fiber bundle with fiber Y. Now there is a corresponding spectral sequence for the cohomology relating the cohomology of the total space and the cohomology of the base. Um, and if Y is affine, then you obtain a map, an induced map from this equivalent cohomology group to uh, the group cohomology valued in the in the fiber. Now, the sort of spaces we're looking at, um, which I remind you are come from um, X with a finite number of points removed are not affine. So that doesn't, this argument doesn't quite work, but you can uh, make them affine just by removing hyperplanes. So if you start removing hyperplanes, uh, now um, your um, space X star becomes affine and, uh, and you obtain this map. Now, there is no way to remove a finite collection of hyperplanes that's G stable. So in some sense, you have to remove all hyperplanes. In other words, consider the direct limit of these cohomologies. And, um, and that's how um, an equivalent cohomology class here would give rise to a group co-cycle valued in, some, um, in, the, in this direct limit here. So, um, we can work out exactly um, what these co-cycles are in all different cases, but um, for this talk, I want to focus on the elliptic case. Um, so let me explain a little bit more um, where these equivalent cohomology classes come from in the elliptic case. Um, so if you take a manifold M and you um, consider a torus bundle over M, so by this I mean the, the fibers 
R S1 to the end. Oh, um, right. Um, oh, sorry. Um, right, so, so the fibers, and uh, now I can fix a positive integer m, and I can look at the m torsion in T. And uh, this is now a covering space. On each fiber, you have finitely many uh, points that are m torsion. So um, both T, M, and the image of the zero section here have fundamental classes um, that lie in the same degree um, in the HN of T with Z coefficients. And now um, there is an observation, which is that um, this linear combination of these two classes um, is actually torsion, or in other words, it vanishes in the cohomology with rational coefficients. Um, so this means that you can look at the long exact sequence of this um, that you get by um, considering the pair of T and T with the M torsion removed. And, um, and uh, well, um, yeah, there is a class in the um, cohomology of degree N minus one that lifts uh, the class T M minus M to the N zero, which lives in this relative cohomology group of degree N. Um, and of course, this class is in principle unique only modulo the image of the previous group. But in fact, um, there is a canonical choice, and uh, I'm not sure um, who uh, this observation uh, should be, who this observation should be attributed to. Um, it, it appears, for example, in Cato's paper on, on Ziegel units, uh, but it might have been observed before that. Um, there is a unique choice of class, provided that you also ask that um, when you push forward um, the class by primes that are co-prime to M, um, the class stays the same. And this is related to the fact that the push forward by L has um, um, eigen, uh, the eigenvalues of the push forward by L acting on this group do not include one. So by, by um, asking this extra condition, you sort of kill the ambiguity of of the pre-image. And this is the class that we're interested in. Now, um, what's the relation to the abstract equivalent class I was describing before? Well, if you start, um, if you take e to the n is your space x and you remove um, sort of the m torsion points in the first copy of e, um, and then you let g be um, the standard group gamma zero m, then um, this all becomes very familiar because EG is just um, the symmetric space um, of SL and R. Um, BG is the quotient of the symmetric space by gamma zero M. So it's, a, it's the locally symmetric space attached to gamma zero of M. And this fiber bundle is just this universal torus bundle over Y zero M. So, the previous construction gives you a class in degree 2n minus 1 of, um, of this um, sort of n-fold product of the, of the universal, um, yeah, sorry, uh, of, the, of the universal elliptic group. Um, and by the construction I explained before, once you have an equivariant cohomology class, you get a group cohomology class uh, where you just remove hyperplanes on the fibers. So this is, um, yeah, this is the construction of a, of a co-cycle. Um, so this co-cycle can be explicitly computed and I will explain a little bit more how a bit later, but for now, let me explain uh, that as you might expect, this is related to very classical objects. So you take E to be an elliptic curve uh, and M is a positive integer then there is a canonical unit um, in the function field of E, and it's um, characterized by having divisor the m torsion minus m squared times the zero section, um, and by being invariant by push forward by L. So um, when you're just looking at one copy of the elliptic curve, the class I'm talking about is just um, dg over g, um, where g is this canonical uh, unit also um, known as a zero unit. 
Uh, now, if you take e to the n, you obtain this class here. Uh, and so here is a um, result um, regarding these cost cycles. Um, I, OK, so it says, um, if you consider not exactly SM, but a slightly modified version, um, where one um, takes a linear combination um, um, of this form, then this is also a cost cycle. And it's given by an explicit polynomial in, in uh, translates of these uh, modular units here. Um, so I won't write down the polynomial explicitly now because I will consider the CM case in a bit and then I will give you uh, a completely explicit formula. Um, but yeah, this sort of generalizes the, observation, the initial observations uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of Sedge to um, the case of n-fold uh, products of elliptic curves. Um, any questions for now? Okay. So, right. So, um, what I would like to do is explain um, a bit how one computes this thing. So, I have set up this abstract structure um, of um, uh, abstract equivalent cohomology, uh, where, but we would actually like to compute this thing, uh, for example, um, like I explained in the previous slide. And uh, for that, we use this powerful um, theory developed by Matai and Quillen, which is really a theory of um, characteristic differential forms attached to vector bundles. So, um, so this theory is a generalization of Chernveil theory, or, or uh, and maybe a, a refinement of Chernveil theory. Um, namely, um, if you take a complex vector bundle E over a base, then you have churn classes, which are cohomology classes on the base. Um, and uh, the main observation of churn rate theory is that if you choose some additional data, in this case, a metric on the fibers, then you can promote these cohomology classes to actual differential forms. Um, so what Matai and Quillen did was um, they refined this theory to include um, transgressions. So, um, so for example, um, given a vector bundle um, E over X, you have a um, general theory gives you a form uh, that is called a Tom form. And its cohomology class represents um, integration. Um, I mean, is sorry, it's cohomologous to uh, uh, the zero section. So you can, you can um, if you look at the space uh, of currents and you look at the difference between the tone form and this integration on the zero section current, um, you know that this difference is actually zero in cohomology. So this equation should have a solution eta. But what Matei and Quillen give you is actually a, a solution eta that's actually functorial. So a preferred solution of this of this equation, and um, so this eta form eta is called a transgression, and uh, this form eta is going to play uh, uh, the main role in in our computations. So, um, right. So let me explain a little bit how the formulas um, go, and um, instead of explaining um, the general elliptic case, I want to. I'm now going to show you some formulas on the symmetric space um, attached to SLMC. Um, and the reason I uh, want to do that is because I want to focus on um, um, our results on CM elliptic curves. And, uh, and for that, we, we need to consider um, um, quotients of um, the symmetric space of SLMC by arithmetic groups. So, okay, so let X be SLMC not SUN, the symmetric space of SLNC. And now we take V to be the trivial vector bundle with fiber C to the N. Now, um, you can think of the space SLNC mod SUN as the space of Hermitian matrix on C to the N of determinant one. Um, so here you're just sending uh, a coset like this into um, 
I guess um, G embers P G bar embers. Uh, so this is a this is a positive definite Hermitian matrix. Okay, so um, a point on this symmetric space is a Hermitian metric on C to the n of determinant one. And therefore, uh, this bundle V uh, inherits a tautological metric. So on, on the fiber of X, you give it the metrics, the, the, the metric represented by, the, by that point. Um, and um, um, now, so this vector bundle V as a bare vector bundle is, it's of course trivial, but it's interesting uh, how its metric varies over X. And now if you apply the construction of Mattei and Quinn and I mentioned before, um, you get a canonical differential form of degree 2n minus 1 on this vector bundle V. And um, it has the property that um, the transgression I was mentioning in the previous slide is the Mellin transform of this form, um, psi and q. So in other words, this form um, here satisfies an equation like that. Um, it's, it's a primitive for the difference of the current of integration along the zero section and uh, integration against this uh, tone form. Okay, so now um, we want to um, use this uh, um, to construct some differential forms that we can uh, use as test vectors um, at the Archimedean place for certain Eisenstein series. And um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the form we just constructed has degree two and minus one. Um, however, um, for um, our purposes, we're interested in having forms of degree n minus one. So one has to do something to uh, uh, go from degree two n minus one to degree n minus one. And what you do is the following. You take the form eta mqs and you take a certain component of this form. So, um, right, so, so you write eta mq as a sum like this, so you have uh, an expression like this where this form here is horizontal uh, with respect to the uh, map from the vector bundle V to X, then you just want to keep the, comp the component that uh, has I be one to N and J to be T. And um, so you, you do that and then you pull back by V where you think of V, so V is the trivial vector bundle with fiber C to the N um, over X. So you pull back by this vector and, um, and you get a differential form on X. And this is um, our test vector. So yes, yeah, sorry, uh, apologies um, for that. I didn't realize that um, this would erase. Um, so, um, right, it turns out that this is a very nice Archimedean test vector to form an Eisenstein series with. So, um, and in fact, um, this can be explicitly computed and I, I can show you um, the formulas. So, so if I think of a point in X to be a Hermitian matrix, I know the entries by HIJ. So I can think of each entry as a smooth function on X, which assigns to um, the each matrix the corresponding entry. Um, so then I can introduce for a given vector V, I can introduce a smooth function, um, which comes from multiplying this matrix with the vector, that's a smooth function on X. I can differentiate that smooth function and I get a one form on X. And then, so here is a um, wedge of N minus one of these things. So this is a N minus one form. And the form we just constructed is given by this explicit expression here. So you have this linear combination of differential forms and then you quotient by this thing, which is really the norm of V um, with respect to the uh, metric defined by H. So this is an N minus one form on X. Um, and 
it has a number of nice properties that that will um, that will allow us to compute some of its periods. So let me explain what those properties are. So first of all, um, when s equals zero, uh, the form is closed. Um, second, um, the form eta is the Mellin transform of a certain um, differential form psi. And this differential form psi is a differential form on the symmetric space x um, that takes values in the Schwartz space um, of C to the n. And um, in fact, this form is an eigenvector of the Fourier transform. And in some sense, one can think of it as the analog for S L and C of the kudla milson forms for, um, for the orthogonal and unitary groups. Um, so, so, yeah, um, that's, that's what psi is. Um, one can also introduce coefficients um, and consider forms valued in a space um, which, yeah, it's, so it's uh, differential form valued in this local system, which, corres which consists of um, the tensor product of the polynomials, holomorphic polynomials of degree P on C to the N and the anti-holomorphic polynomials of degree Q in C to the N. And uh, okay, you, you can introduce a form with coefficients, which is given by this explicit formula here. And um, finally, the integral uh, on each torus of, uh, on the, yeah, the integral of the diagonal torus can be computed explicitly. Um, so this is, this will be important because this will um, allow us to compute our Archimedean integrals when we, when we evaluate periods. Um, right. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I want to use this test. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, in the eta pq, what was the, you said you had the argument v. v belongs to where? v belongs still to c to the v n? v belongs, belongs to c to the n. What? v belongs to c to the n. c to the n, not the v pq that you had before, just v, just c to the n. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, for those who are wondering what- Yeah, I mean, Q is a polynomial of degree uh, Q and you evaluate that B. All right, okay, and P is a polynomial in the derivatives, also of N derivatives, DZ1 to DZN, okay. Exactly, okay. exactly, this differentiates the function eta along, along, the, along the derivatives, yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, so um, now I want to use this form to, uh, to this differential form to form Einstein series. Um, so let me take a K is an imaginary quadratic field, O is the ring of integers, and lambda is an O lattice in K to the N. And um, using eta, I can form an Eisenstein series as usual. I sum over the lattice and I use V to um, translate, uh, to consider a translate of the lattice lambda. And this is of course, an n minus one form um, taking uh, the lives in this quotient x by the stabilizer of v. Uh, and now by the properties I explained before, um, the, um, this form is closed at s equals zero. This is because the form eta is closed at s equals zero. And um, we can, we are also going to consider a modification of this thing that um, is sometimes called a smoothing, where we are going to take a linear combination of uh, these Einstein series for two different lattices. So um, I, I take the Einstein series for lattice O to the N and for a lattice that contains O to the N um, uh, with index, um, the rest, the cardinality of the rest of the field of a certain prime ideal P. And um, um, the reason I'm doing this is because by taking this linear combination, I can guarantee that this has vanishing constant term at certain cusps, uh, which will play a role later. Okay, so now I want to take this Einstein series and I want to integrate it on some cycles in the space. So um, let me define those cycles. They are called modular symbols. They generalize the modular symbols I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, so I take, um, I take N matrices in gamma zero P and um, let me assume that, um, so I formed the matrix of first columns of these matrices. 
And I'm going to assume that that matrix is invertible. Uh, this is not really an assumption. I mean, otherwise you just set some quantities I'm going to define to be equal to zero. Um, but assuming that, um, corresponding to this um, collection of n matrices, there is a modular symbol living in X. And um, one way to think of it is that if, you're, if you think of elements of X as being Hermitian metric, metrics on C to the n, um, your, the, the points on the modular symbol correspond to metrics that make this an orthogonal basis of C to the n, this particular connect, connection of, of n vectors. So this is a sub-manifold of dimension n minus one. And um, as I mentioned before, um, um, this operation of taking something called a smoothing gives you uh, an Eisenstein series that is rapidly decreasing on this modular symbol, provided that V lies outside of some hyperplanes. So I want to be a little bit more precise about that. Um, Namely, um, so in the symmetric space X, um, the cusps correspond to flags. Um, so um, proper flags um, where the spaces W, I are defined over K. And now you can look at the cusps that lie on the closure of this modular symbol. And they are the flags that are formed by taking, um, where each of member of the flag is formed by taking the span of some of these vectors for some subset of um, the indices one to n. And um, now I can um, make that, upset, that um, claim more precise. Um, this exercise series is rapidly decreasing provided that V does not belong to any of these um, spaces um, that you get by taking, um, so any proper subspace spanned by these vectors gamma one E1 up to gamma N E1. We shouldn't lie there. So for a given collection of uh, N matrices, um, you want to take um, your vector V outside of certain hyperplanes defined by those matrices. And then you know that this Einstein series is rapidly decreasing. And the reason I wanted to be rapidly decreasing is because um, well, integrating the Einstein series on the modular symbol will give a co-cycle um, and uh, um, I want to compute that cycle. And um, so the values of this cycle are, value, are polynomials in Kronecker Eisenstein series. So let me explain um, how that works. So first of all, um, Kronecker Eisenstein series are uh, extremely classical objects. Um, you take a fractional ideal in the imaginary quadratic field K that we have fixed, and you look at this sum. It's just um, an Einstein series for the lattice given by uh, the ideal inside the complex numbers. Um, it depends on two indices, P and Q, which are non-negative integers. And it has singularities um, when Z belongs to the fractional ideal. And uh, OK, this is all uh, very classical. The sum, as usual, converges for real part of S large enough. It's regular at 0, its analytic continuation is. And it has very um, it well understood algebraicity properties. When you evaluate at a point in K, um, you know um, that you get something that's algebraic up to a certain uh, multiple of pi and omega infinity, which is the period of an elliptic curve with CM. Um, and moreover, you have very good control on, on this algebraic number because there is a reciprocity law that relates the Galois action on this um, algebraic number with by a class field theory with, with Z0. So I want to consider polynomials in these objects. So, okay, I, here it comes a little bit, it gets a little bit heavy, but um, hopefully not too much. So I want to consider products of N of these Eisenstein series. So I, I have to choose, for each of them, I have to choose a pair of integers, and this gives me um, these collections of integers, uppercase I and uppercase J. And then I get this collection here. And now, given a lattice in O, I can define uh, this, this um, thing here. Um, so here is a finite sum. And, uh, and uh, again, you're just, um, it's basically a, a polynomial in 
a homogeneous polynomial uh, in chronic resistance series. And uh, now I'm going to define a cycle that takes values in the space of functions that span by this. Um, so let me note that by, by f. Um, and uh, finally, again, I'm going to consider some um, smoothing, uh, meaning one looks at um, um, some certain linear combinations of these polynomials of chronic Einstein series for the lattice O n and for lattices that contain O n um, with some with prime degree, let's say. Um, so, okay, so these are the objects. And finally, um, given a matrix A, I'm going to define a quantity that um, well, is defined by this equation here. Um, okay, so the important thing is that these expressions D, I, J, P, Z, A are given by an explicit polynomial depending on, on A of chronic Einstein series evaluated at, um, at points of the imaginary quadratic field. Okay, and now I can tell you what the um, what this co-cycle is. So when you integrate this thing uh, here, um, so first of all, if you integrate, so I'm, I define EP to be the expression you get by integrating our Eisenstein series on this modular symbol I introduced before. And um, the first thing that you find is that this is a homogeneous co-cycle. Um, and, uh, and uh, also, um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it satisfies this invariance property because, um, I mean, this is very easy to see because of the equivariance properties of E. And uh, the second property comes from the fact that a certain linear combination of modular symbols is the boundary of some natural cycle on the, on the um, symmetric space. Uh, and uh, okay, so here is the explicit formula. Given a collection of n matrices, um, you get, uh, you can form this matrix that I mentioned before. Uh, you form the matrix of first columns, and then this co-cycle, which is by definition the um, result of integrating our Einstein series on this modular symbol, is given by this explicit linear combination of uh, chronic Einstein series. Um, so. Right, so, so yeah, so that's the explicit expression for the cycle. So in fact, the fact that you can put um, Kronecker as a group cycle of this form was conjectured by Sedge. And, um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is our proof. Um, okay, so now I want to explain the application we have in mind for this, which is to critical values. Um, and uh, so the application is uh, goes like this. You take a degree n extension of k, n is the norm map, and uh, I fix some integral ideals. Um, and um, okay, so I fix ideals a and f. U, f are the units of um, the ring of integers of L, that I convert to one mod f. And then I can define um, this expression here, which is a partial zeta function. And uh, so the reason uh, to consider these partial zeta functions is that um, you can express L values of Hecke characters um, of L in terms of these partial zeta functions, provided that um, the character has um, a certain form. I'll, I'll write it down as um, And uh, so our main result here is that this quantity can be given an explicit expression using EP. And um, so in particular, the value at zero of this partial zeta function is really given by uh, explicit polynomial in this chronic Einstein series. And um, so this was actually an identity like that was proved by Colmez when um, the extension has degree two or when it has degree larger than two, but only when q equals zero. And this was proved in his thesis in a um, quite difficult paper and where he, um, yeah, where he basically uh, proved an expression like this. And he conjectured that um, a similar expression exists for every q. Um, and of course, because of the, um, 
known properties, algebraic properties of uh, chronic Einstein series, um, this L function L phi, um, has, uh, this implies the algebraicity that's expected for this L function. Um, so, so this includes, for example, all Hecke, all um, L functions for algebraic Hecke characters of extensions where K is the maximal CM field in, in L. Um, so for those L functions, we, we obtain uh, proof of algebraicity. Um, I should say also that um, there, there has been an independent recent proof for um, of this algebraicity uh, for K and arbitrary um, CM field by uh, Guido Kring, Kings and Johannes Sprang. Um, um, and, uh, but I will explain um, some of the properties of our expression that we hope can be um, used uh, to, to obtain some extra information uh, in the case of, uh, in, in the case we consider. So, okay, so how, do, how does one prove this? So the first step is that this is well known. Um, instead of considering modular symbols, you can also integrate Eisenstein series on um, cycles that come from units on, on extensions of K. Um, so this is what we do. We um, look at the elements of norm one in L and, uh, and attach to uh, a, an ideal F, you can, you can define a certain cycle that I call XF, I mentioned minus one inside gamma mod X. And now when you integrate EP tilde on this cycle, um, you get essentially the partial zeta value I was talking about. There is this factor here, which has to do with the fact that you have to choose a basis, but this is really not I mean, it's a very simple algebraic number. Um, and again, yeah, you, can, you, you obtain a value for some slightly modified version of the partial data function. So this, yeah, this is not really surprising that the integral of E tilde on this compact um, submanifold gives a zeta value because, well, it's a well-known general principle. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we're able to compute the Archimedean integral and that's why we obtain this thing here. And now, so basically the idea is that we want to relate, um, we want to express zeta values in terms of uh, polynomials of chronic Eisenstein series. Um, zeta values are related to integrating the Eisenstein series on a compact cycle and I, chronic Eisenstein series are related to integral and modular symbols. So we want to move from the cycle inside this locally symmetric space in the interior to the boundary. And you we can do that using an explicit homotopy. Um, and the idea is actually quite easy. If you have, um, for example, if you have, um, right here. So for example, if you have n equals three, an extension of degree three, then, um, then the group of units congruent to one mod F is generated by two units, U1 and U2. And you obtain uh, the action of the group of units gives you a fundamental parallelogram. So here we have X, U1, X, U2, X, and U1, U2, X. And you have to integrate the Einstein series on this fundamental parallelogram here, living inside the locally symmetric space, but you can divide this fundamental parallelogram into two simplices, um, or in general for any n, you can um, um, chop it into a union of simplices um, use, uh, where the union varies over the, the symmetric group here. And now each of these, you move to the corresponding modular symbol. So, I mean, I guess here I have, um, so here I'm taking gamma zero to be, gamma zero x to be x, and this is what I call u one x. And here we have what I call u1, u2x. Uh, and now basically you move um, this simplex to the boundary uh, and the fact that you have canceled the constant terms on the Einstein series um, tells you that um, uh, the integral over the sort of over the top triangle in this figure and the bottom triangle give the same result. Um, the only problem that's left is that 
Um, when you do that, um, it is possible that as you move towards the modular symbol, um, you're trying to evaluate this cross cycle at a point at one of these hyperplanes that you are not allowed to evaluate in because they are singular and the Einstein series is not rapidly decreasing. Um, and if you remember, uh, some time ago, I explained that um, the vectors where you're allowed to evaluate the cross cycle depend on the particular collection of matrices. So there is no universal solution to this problem. Um, but luckily, you can do a little trick where, where you choose one more prime uh, and, and you, use, you basically shift um, the lattice that you're considering by that prime. And then everything works well. Um, and so here is, here is our uh, main result regarding these zeta values. So basically, it says the zeta values are given by this explicit um, expression um, in values of the co-cycle, and therefore in terms of an explicit polynomial in this Kronecker-Einstein series. Now, right. Um, yeah, so that's the explicit formula. Now, um, what does this imply for L values? Well, so as I mentioned before, um, you can look at arbitrary extensions um, L of K, where K is the maximal CM field. And then every algebraic Hecke character um, of L can be written as a finite order Hecke character times something that factors through the norm to K. Um, so if you take such a character of weight PQ, uh, then, uh, well, using the algebraic properties of current Christian series, you obtain this, this formula here, which was um, part of what was conjectured by Deline for these L values. And uh, you can do a little bit better if you take omega infinity to be the real period of our elliptic curve defined over the maximal abelian extension of K. Then you can, then you know that the algebraic part of the L value belongs to this um, field here, which is the CM field generated by these values. Um, the integrality properties um, also follow and the periodic interpolation also follow uh, from this. These were also proved by Kings and Spang in the, in the more general setting. Um, but what we also get um, is a very um, strong control of the Galois action on this, on this number um, because, well, because you have such a thing for, um, for chronic Einstein series. So we haven't really checked yet, but it seems very plausible that um, using the reciprocity law of Blasius, one can really prove the Lin's conjecture for, um, for these L values. Um, yeah, and um, well, I think this is all I wanted to say. And uh, I guess we come to the, my last slide. So um, happy birthday, Steve. Yes, thanks a lot. Lucia, for an excellent talk. Quite chill comments. Um, I have a question, Louis. Yeah. So when you um, def you talked about this methaquilin form, uh, you wrote it as a Millian transform with this parameter s, right? Um, so if you look at the Taylor expansion in s at s equals zero, and look at some of the higher terms, that, does that tell you anything about? Um, I haven't thought about that. Um, there it is. Yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I will have to look into it. Okay. We can discuss it later. Okay, next. And the pledges? Okay, a lot. I thank Lucy again. Don't uh, remember you have an hour at 12 where I have a celebration. So because we're on Zoom, bring your own food and your own alcohol and or beer or whatever you have. <laughs>